I sorry, I don't remember your last name. Uh, and I have this amazing guest, uh, Gulan. Um, where is where are Gulan? Han står där uppe. Uh, from the Deacon, from the K K K T H. And then I have my my father farthest away, uh, Kentaro K Toyama. Is that correct to, to say your name that way? Uh, who is the keynote speaker for tomorrow? And I'm so honoured that you actually wanted to join us in this session, talking about digital competence. And yeah, and we're going to talk in English because you speak English, don't you? Yeah. So th the other panelists were. Yeah, I'm going to give it to Kentaro. Actually, <laughs> I'm really, really, really going to make a difference. And you can say hey to one another. And uh, I'm based in Sweden. And um, actually, this panel came to be because of you, because the the project manager for the Internet Days he said maybe you want Kentaro to be part of your panel, and I said yes, I want that. And then I invited all the other people to say something against you. So I thought, <laughs> yeah. And so I thought we, we should start this panel by they have all talked except Gulan, uh, and so and you haven't heard them, so they have to introduce themselves to you. But I would like you to start. Please tell us more about who are you, and what is your perspective on children's knowledge about digital uh, skills. Uh, thank you. So it's a little bit difficult to um, know exactly how to answer that question in this context. But uh, I help am. You. Thank you. <laughs> I am uh, a faculty member at the University of Michigan School of Information. Uh, I used to work for Microsoft for 12 years, uh, and my background is in computer science. Um, but uh, after several years working in India, to use uh, digital technologies as a way to support education, agriculture, healthcare. Uh, and other things there, I came to the conclusion that as much as technology can be helpful, uh, it is much, much more important in many cases to really work on human institutions and individuals, uh, and that technology is at best a uh, amplifier of underlying uh, human intentions and capacities, not the primary things that, that makes the world better. Uh, in education, I think that means that um, you know, in many contexts where the educational system is good, uh, and I, you know, I'm, at least from a distance, I'm a big fan of uh, much of the educational system in not only in Sweden, but across Scandinavia. And so I think these are contexts where technology can be used in a positive way. But for me, the biggest challenge with education is not people who I know are going to get a good education. They're people who, for various reasons, will not receive a good education, whether uh, they are uh, poorer children in the United States or across the developing world. And so for those uh, children, my feeling is that it's much, much more important to work on the basics and the foundations of education and not uh, oversell technology. Yeah, thank you. And uh, um, we only have two mics. You have to share. Either all the Swedes share and you have the one. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how. Uh, please. Uh, I invited Gulen, the deacon of uh, K. Kotehua. I can't do that in English. <laughs> K T H. The technical. Um, Royal school. Institute yes. of Technology. Thank you. <laughs> deacon please. is also a very fascinating title. I have to look that up. I haven't. Yeah, you, ha you aren't that. I thought you were. <laughs> Dean. In Dean. English. Sorry. Uh, anyway, I invited you because you are the have been at least the digital champion of Sweden. And I you still have, am. And I you still am. are. And you were the uh, the chairman of the digital uh, commission. I was. Yeah, you I was. was. Yes, I know. <laughs> I know you're not. <laughs> and I thought working in the high school, you actually have perspectives on digital competition, but I'm mostly, you know that, I always flirt with you as a researcher because I love your research, because you have looked at how humans and computer scientists and those ordering and asking for, for, for programs, how they actually don't communicate. Please, can't you give us some 
insights on who you are and on your research. Wow, <laughs> and that's so many, many subjects to touch upon. First of all, uh, uh, I seem to be adding new titles to, to myself every time that I introduce myself. So since three weeks back, I have a new title. So I'm now vice president of the university for digitalization, which is fascinating in itself because I've, I've been out speaking and complaining about universities being the worst organization to adapt to digitalization and modernize themselves. And what's the best way of making me silence? That's to put me in charge of that <laughs> at my university. So, so now it's actually up to prove that. So that in itself is, is a new fascinating role uh, that, that I will mostly uh, plan for for the next few months and then start uh, for full uh, beginning next year. Uh, so that's one thing. I'm a professor in human-computer interaction, so, so therefore I'm, I'm, I'm mostly interested in, in the between thing, the between computers and human beings and, and how we can shape that in a better way. Uh, also, when debating these things in different audiences such as this, I think that, that uh, it's also interesting to not only talk about ICT and digitalization of, of the schools, but actually looking through the university's role in that, which I'm sure you will also touch upon. So I think that, that universities now have been completely focused on educating people between 19 and 25 years, and then sort of stop and, and then you say bye bye to your students never to see them again and i think that that um, universities in the future needs to be much more engaged with lifelong learning and lifelong learning is is mostly viewed as learning uh, when you've been working for a while and need to reskill or, or or further educate yourself but actually considering lifelong learning should also mean that we as universities should look at education earlier on in life. And one of the biggest problems we have these days is the lack of uh, students that want to do computer science and IT, simply because they lose their interest in IT earlier on. And that's, that's uh, really bad. Uh, IT och Telekomföretagen in Sweden recently made a study saying that this uh, uh, 70,000 jobs missing a uh, suitable person for it right now in Sweden. In the European Commission they say it's somewhere between 700,000 and, uh, and 1.5 million missing and, and a lot of other countries in the world are, are claiming that there's missing people for that. So as a university professor I can't simply increase the number of students I take in because there are not enough students that are willing to do this. So therefore I think that we as universities should be much more concerned about where do people lose their interest in, in IT, computers, digitalization, and all sorts of things throughout their education, because we need to, to uh, move further on that. The final thing I wanted to say that I think is also a fascinating project that we've been running at KTH now recently is we've been doing a quick course, we call it Software Development Academy, a quick course, 12 week course for uh, newly arrived immigrants to Sweden that have a higher education that could quickly be educated to, to match the Swedish employment system. And this has been a really successful uh, attempt that we've done. We educated 25 people this spring, uh, funded by Wallenberg Stiftelsen, and now we're going to do 250 uh, oh, following. Uh, but then they say, well, then our funding stops, <laughs> so then you need to find new mechanisms for doing this. Mm. But from my perspective, this is really something that we should focus much more on if we want to fill the gap of, of missing skills in, in the digital area. I'm going to stop there. Yeah, I will let the rest of the panel shortly introduce themselves to Kentaro, because yeah. it's mostly for him. You're yeah, introducing absolutely. yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anders Storesson, I'm a Swedish uh, freelance reporter. I've written about uh, ICT for uh, 20 years now, uh, recently much about how technology affects society in different ways and also education. Yeah. And Susan? Susan Schellander. And uh, I'm a teacher from the beginning, but uh, I've been doing research for about 15 years. And I'm also a teacher educator. Um, what my research is about, um, it's digitalizing of uh, school and now preschool. 
And my name is Edbjerde Nikolaisten, and I'm from Denmark. Um, I'm a teacher also, first and foremost. Uh, and then I'm a, an ICT consultant at a digital uh, publishing company in Denmark who produces uh, digital learning materials for uh, K1 to K10. And we're also here in Sweden now. So, but it's from Denmark I'm coming from, okay? Since I have the, the honor of having to decide who talks first, I'm going to address Kentaro again. <laughs> I have to uh, ask you, uh, if, you, if we look at this divide that you see that digital or, or technology can actually address, or maybe not address, but make huger or bigger, how do we actually make it smaller and possible for poor kids or kids in the developing countries or areas in Sweden where they don't have the ability to all the computers or the teachers with all the digital competence and all that? How do we actually do to address that problem? Uh, that's a good question. And I'm also going to intentionally take a little bit more extreme stance than I might otherwise to make the panel yes, interesting. Yes, I love it. <laughs> um, so... Um, you know, one thing uh, I always look for are analogies to our current situation. Uh, you know, the internet and digital technologies are relatively new for many of us, and so it's really difficult to get distance from them and to think about them in a rational way. Uh, but one of the ways to think about it is that, um, you know, this is a you know, tool, as some of the speakers have already said, that is uh, increasingly all over uh, uh, society, all of, you know, throughout our lives. You know, we sleep with these devices next to us. Um, and so they're obviously very important in some way. But at the same time, that importance doesn't mean that we necessarily have to uh, expose our young children to them as early as possible. So, for example, you know, in a, few, in a previous generation, uh, automobiles became suddenly very important, right? Most adults, uh, at least in you know, certain parts of the world, cannot travel without an automobile. Uh, and yet, we don't expect that our five-year-olds are exposed to uh, moving vehicles, and we don't expect to train them to drive when they're uh, seven years old and so on. Um, it's because a certain amount of maturity is required before you can take this extremely powerful uh, technology and use it in a responsible way. And I think with digital technology, uh, it's a same situation, except that there's so much apparent positive side that we are very quick to dismiss the potential negative side that it requires a significant amount of responsibility to handle. And so um, oftentimes we're very eager to introduce the technology to children, not realizing that they still lack the same kind of self-control that would be required to be a safe driver. Uh, and, and, and it happens in a much kind of uh, subtler way, and so it's harder to see. It's not as easy to see why, you know, children sitting in front of uh, computers necessarily possibly hurting themselves in the long term or hurting others in the long term. So I'll, uh, I'll start with that. And then with respect to the um, inequality question, I do think that technology's effect tends to be to amplify uh, differences. And so that means that even if you provide everybody with the same technology, it's those of us who have a, the strongest uh, basic education that can make the most use of it, and those of us without that education cannot make as much use of it, which means that even if everybody were to benefit, the inequality actually increases. I have to get the, the mic to say something. <laughs> What, what's your response? You have to respond. <laughs> yeah, you have to because because you work with small children and we are, and looking how they use technology in the uh, sense of preschool education, yeah. don't you? Well, this is a concern I have as well, obviously. And uh, in Sweden, you can hear about people lecturing all around the country saying, oh, we don't need to buy any guitars now because we have guitar apps and we don't need any clay, we don't need coloring paints and stuff because we have that in the apps. And of course, that would be absolutely devastating if all our children would actually experience the whole world uh, at a flat screen. Um, but also, I know that they are so interested in, in this and we can't... Um, if we prohibit, they will want it even more. <laughs> they will want it like they want uh, sweets in, uh, in on a Tuesday, for example. <laughs> and uh, <Hey>. okay, <laughs> thank you, thanks. <laughs> um, and also, I think there are some 
possibilities with the digital media for smaller children as for example when they want to make a puzzle but they don't have the fine motorics for making a puzzle they can uh, get closer to that sort of activities by doing it uh, digitally first and then try it for real and things like that for example also with writing because writing is a really hard uh, skill to manage when you're just two or three years old, but it's a lot more easier to actually press uh, um, an A on the computer than actually writing it with a pen. But thinking of what you say, and let's th thinking back on what uh, Gulan said, and he said he has the problem of no students really wanting to attend his uh, uh, university. Where does it end? Where, where, where does the interest stop? Because if they can't, have it, it's a, such a big craving in the technology, but they don't want to work with it, or they want to uh, develop it, or they don't want to do it in the university, where does it end? Yeah, I'm not sure I can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I'm not sure I can answer that either, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I don't think any of us can, but um, but I think uh, the reason why we should work with uh, digital technologies with kids also uh, is because when they're kids, they're still um, very innovative, innovative in their minds. They're very experimenting. Uh, they're not so afraid of making mistakes. Um, so when you're working with kids uh, and digital technologies, they will uh, use it as a toy, as you were talking about too. Um, uh, and, and I think we should take it uh, even further than just working with tablets. We should work with microbits, uh, with uh, preschoolers and, and kids in first to third grade. Um, because uh, they would, uh, by, by giving them this uh, technical tool that's also uh, um, um, a f a f a artifact, that you can actually touch and feel and, and, and get to do stuff, uh, that would actually give them an understanding of uh, a broader perspective on, on the digital uh, skills, I think, I believe. Um, and I think that uh, when we're making digital learning materials to, uh, to young kids, we're actually very much thinking about uh, that we're only a tool and we're only uh, catalyzing the content to them. Uh, they are still going out there to paint with paint and play with puzzles and and stuff like that. They should do that all the time when it gives meaning to the activity that they do that. And other times when you actually uh, can, can use a digital tool like, the, for example, the read engine I was talking about, to, to differentiate the reading process and give extra value to the reading process, why shouldn't you use uh, that technology that's actually in hand for you? So I think we should be very much more focused on how we can add extra value to uh, the classroom and to the teaching by uh, inviting these digital technologies into the classroom instead of being so afraid and or being so uh, uh, impressed with it. Something in between where we're also acting critical uh, towards it. If we're as a digital publisher would do that, I think everyone else should do that too because we're living from this. But we're very much fond of analog uh, stuff also. It isn't a uh, question about either or, but but I, I want to ask. I think I want to ask Anders that. Uh, what do actually teachers or parents need to know about this technology to actually foster a, a, a knowledge or a, 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 a willingness to learn more about the digital? Uh, tools yeah. as tools, not only as a way of communication and not ending up on only looking at YouTube, not actually being part of and creating for it. Yeah. I, I, think I, I think it's I important to recognize that we are actually discussing two different things here uh, at the same time. One is how technology should be used within the classrooms as tools. Uh, but it's also about what the students have to learn about, uh, how the technology works, etc. Uh, and see the possibilities, but also the dangers with, with technology. Uh, during the last year, we have had our fair share of IT security uh, problems Breaches, in Sweden yeah. with, with uh, outsourcing stuff. And, and, and I, I don't know what's the cause of that, but I, I guess that a lack of understanding about what technology actually is, is a part of the problem. And we, we can't have a society where there it's only the people that develops technology 
who understands how technology works, because we are all users of technology. And, and because of that, I think it's important to, to not only focus the discussion about tools in education, but also about what education has to be about. Yeah, yeah and uh, what does it education has to be about. Please tell us. Give us uh, some insights. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's a lot of different yes, things. Uh, the algorithms uh, and, and personalization is, is one thing. Yeah. Per, uh, privacy, uh, I, basic IT security. Um, is it a good or bad idea to vote online in, in democratic elections? Uh, that's a discussion that's been been uh, we have had here in Sweden, and to understand why that's not perhaps a good idea, you you have to understand that that th the way you implement technology also has an end game that doesn't necessarily is the thing you were after in, in the first place. Uh, so there is no easy answer to this. I mean, we we are having conferences like this, and and we are discussing many different aspects. I was uh, on another uh, track listening to robots and how they are to be used in, in different uh, aspects of, of society and the people working with that can't just be the technolo uh, technologists, but it has to be different uh, um, people involved. But I, I don't have a, a clear answer about what, but, but it's a lot more than that's teached in, in schools today. Do you think, honestly, that uh when the students know more about the technology and understand how it works and why it works in a certain way, they will be more interested in becoming a professor at the university? Well, or, maybe or maybe uh, a programmer or data sci scientist? Or well, uh, I'm, I'm going to rewind a little bit and pick up on a few of the subjects that were mentioned. I think that when Digitaliseringskommissionen and were uh, sort of discussing these issues, one of the things we wanted to make clear was a distinction between digital skills and skills for the digital society. And, and we were actually proposing that we would rather be talking about skills for the digital society, that that is what we need to build upon. So there are issues such, a, such as privacy, security, uh, and all sorts of things in relation to this. Now, when uh, the new digital strategy was launched before the summer, they were still talking about digital skills. And I all the time need to, to sort of make sure that this is not actually only about putting programs on the curricula for, for students. It's much more. It's, it's to, to building up this confidence, uh, not only among the children, but among the entire uh, population of our society on using uh, the tools that they have. And I think that I'm, I'm not at all worried about the children's uh, skills in, in sort of using the technology. I'm much more worried about the parents' skills in this and I regularly, when I talk about this, I ask everybody in the audience who, who are parents if they spend equally much time online together with their children as they spend following their children to the football grounds or something like that. Because I really think they should do. Because the best way to teach parents digital or skills for the digital society could actually be through their children. So that they could show all of the things that are there and the mechanisms that are there. The second important thing is, is uh, we have a big uh, sort of uh, distribution of how digitally mature schools are. Uh, we've seen a lot of wonderful examples, as we usually do on these types of conferences, because you don't invite the worst schools in Sweden to <laughs> talk I'd about their experiences. <laughs> you, you, you invite the most I I inspiring people to talk about those things. So we always hear about wonderful, beautiful examples that, that many of you have shared from beforehand, but there's actually quite a few schools that have a kind of a low maturity when it comes to, to, do, to using tools still. 
digital tools and, and they sort of prohibit or limit the use of that simply because equally to parents, teachers may have a, a insufficient confidence in using digital tools. So therefore I think that, that you also need to work to, to foster uh, their maturity and their education on, on that, as you were talking about in, in, in your talk, for, for example. So I think that, that these are sort of the, the biggest hindrances to that. And then you were asking everybody to comment about my comment on why people are not yeah. wanting to do uh, computer science uh, further up in, in the education system. And sort of almost making it sound like, well, our education isn't very popular, so, no, so they no, wouldn't no, want no, to do no, that. No, I didn't but, mean that. But rather, uh. I, rather I'm, I'm kind of surprised that, that um, the fact that, that in... in Swedish gymnasium, you have sort of a, an equal distribution of, of males and females in natural science, for example, but still sort of 15% females in computer science in higher education. So we tend to lose quite a, a few females going in, in, into that. And then overall, the level of uh, the number of students that, that apply there. Uh, are so low and I think it is because they have not been exposed sufficiently to, to computerized tools throughout their education which is something that, that we could sort of trace back not only to gymnasium but to high schools and to kindergartens further on. So I think that the entire system should be much more open and positive to using it and I think that all teachers should build their confidence in teaching without having even equally much knowledge about the computers that they use for teaching as their children have. Because that's what I do as a university professor. My students know more about uh, uh, parts of the computing than I do, but I know something different. And that's a type of confidence that we should build upon. I agree. I totally agree. No, yeah, I'm so impressed with your school. I would love to have gone there myself, but I didn't have the grades, actually. Um, <laughs> So that's the only bias you hear in my voice about the, the technical skills. Um, do they make you change your mind? Um, uh, not quite, although let me say that, you know, I do think that the reasonable position is the one that many people are adopting, which is that, you know, we shouldn't be particularly extreme about the situation. I, you know, I certainly wouldn't argue for a complete ban on technology, although maybe for very young uh, children. Um, and I also think that, yes, in our schools, we should certainly have, uh, um, you know, computing education of various kinds, especially for those students that really want it. So I think that's the reasonable position. But I'm going to still argue for a different kind of way of thinking about this, which is that um, technology has its own ability to make its own case, which is to say that there is an industry behind it that makes a lot of money, that wants you to use more of this technology. Uh, I don't think any one of us on the stage here would believe that you know, our lives should be so thoroughly immersed in digital technology that we should be completely, you know, there should never be a moment in our lives when we're, we're not using technology. And my guess is we also don't want that for our students. Uh, but to protect that space where there is no technology, I think requires that those of us who believe in working towards a better society and who are not working on behalf of large technology companies or arguing for technology provide the counter argument because we are increasingly in the minority and if we don't do that what will end up happening is that the marketing departments of large technology companies will take over and that will become the standard uh, for our society. Um, since I'm in Sweden, I want to use an analogy that uh, I think is Swedish. Uh, smorgasbord is a Swedish yes, concept. Yes, it right? is. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, I think of digital technology as being like a smorgasbord in that it offers everything. It offers some foods that are incredibly nutritious, but it also affords uh, sweets and desserts that on the one hand are good to have, but if you have too much, it's not good for you. Um, you know, you raise the issue of sweets. Uh, and, you know, t for children, the digital technology is, in fact, a smorgasbord. And I think as parents and teachers, our responsibility is not to prohibit the children's ability to engage with that food, but to be very careful about how they interact with it. Maybe some days they can have as much they dessert as they want, but the rest of the week is probably not a good idea to let them be the sole decider of what they're actually uh, doing. And so I think this kind of monitoring as a parent is really critical. Uh, I'm, I'm the father of a three-year-old son, and I noticed that 
you know, if we allow him to use digital technology, he, his attention becomes totally sucked into it because on the other side is an industry whose sole goal is to try to engage your attention for as much as possible and children are susceptible because they don't yet have adult uh, sense of self-control. And so, you know, as a parent, I find myself, even though I would like him to learn a little bit about technology, it's much, much harder to get him away from the technology than it is to get him to engage. Anyone who wants to reflect on that? A bit. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I agree with you a lot of the way. Um, I often hear that um, when we talk about this, and especially uh, concerning young kids, um, a lot of people uh, use the analogy of uh, Silicon Valley, uh, where a lot of uh, the people from the IT industry in Silicon Valley actually chooses uh, Rudolf Steiner and, and uh, other uh, kindergartens and schools for their kids who, are not, who don't have any digital technologies. And... Um, and use that as an argument of uh, if they're saying it, maybe we should listen to that. And uh, I, I agree. And then uh, I also think further on that uh, these kids uh, born and raised in a home uh, of IT experts, they will not be needing the IT skills in the future because they will get it easily from their parents, uh, step by step and in, in good balance. And uh, of course, uh, if, if you're an IT expert, you would choose another way, another road for your kid to show them that uh, my road uh, as a parent is not the only road in this society. But I think uh, what we have to think about is the equality uh, in, in the whole society also. That we have kids who don't have iPhones and iPads and computers at home. They don't have, they, get, they can't afford it. And we have girls, as you mentioned, uh, who don't think they're interesting when they turn 10, 11 years. They, they only think social media is interesting. They don't think it's interesting to use the technology uh, in an engineering way. Um, so we have to, if, if we don't want to lose uh, a big part of these uh, kids, uh, we have to show them still how they use these technologies in, in a good way. And I agree with, uh, I'm sorry I forgot your first, yeah. Um, I, I agree with you that we have to think further than programming and, and using tools here. We have to think about how they, the, the literacy part of it, how do they interact with these, how do they keep balance in their own lives with them. So it's also part of teaching them how to go into creating this balance for myself. Uh, instead of uh, letting the three-year-old, as you mentioned, uh, I have a two-year-old and she's <laughs> just the same way. Um, I try to uh, teach her to, to make balance in that. And I try to teach my nine-year-old who is uh, playing Roblox. He was just on that uh, slide up here with Roblox and YouTube and uh, Minecraft and stuff like that. He could sit there all the time if, he, if I let him. And sometimes I let him if I can see that what he's doing is actually being a, together with his friends. He's creating stuff. He's being interactive, he's being uh, innovative, and other times I say, turn it off because now you're just consuming and your, your mind is, is blown and your, your eyes are red and it's not good for you. So I think we have to teach them how to keep balance in that life between analog and digital uh, technologies. Um, and I, I don't think we can choose, uh, teach them that if we don't expose them to them. Yeah. Uh, well, yes. I, a few years back, I uh, got a proposal from uh, the Swedish broadcast company and they wanted to make an app for preschool out of my research as a um, sort of a representation or transformation uh, on all my research results. And uh, the logic in that app, it's Trip Trap Trad if you know it, and the logic in it was to toss the children out of the app. <laughs> So they would be interested in something and then they would like to go and explore on, out in the nature or um, in the preschool room or something. And what, uh, what we thought while making this app was that it was, would only be used in the preschool with the pedagogues and so on. But they can actually see that it's used quite a lot in the homes as well. But I don't know what happens because I, I haven't, I, my research is only in the preschool. <laughs> yeah, I get yeah. that. Anyone else who wants to reflect on Kentaro? 
Well, I, uh, I usually argue that there's a bigger problem with, with people using uh, IT too little than too much. And of course, we, we need to act as parents for two or three-year-olds. But the question is, when you come up to nine-year-olds, or, or even as my youngest, who's now 17, uh, we really need to be able to teach them to be able to reflect upon this themselves and, and, and make sure to draw lines themselves. Uh, what I see as problems today is more that people have not acquired sufficient uh, experiences from, from using technology. And there's so many ways today uh, that you can use technology in that, that actually brings you out to different other places yes. in, instead. So, so, and I would want to see a more conscious and aware uh, IT industry that would promote and develop much more of those kind of things and actually take some sort of social responsibility How in do doing we do that, that then? Well, well, uh, I mean, we do that already by promoting that type of, of uh, apps and, and programs and uh, oh, applications and, and so forth and, and award them and, and show their benefits in many different ways. But we need much more of that and I think that we're going to get much more of that. I simply see when you engage with children and the way they use technology today, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a lot more different than actually just sitting down and playing a computer game. People do, do completely different things. I, I went into my son's room the other day. Uh, he wasn't there, but he had actually an ongoing Skype conversation with his cousins that are li living an hour away. But there was nobody in that room either. But they had actually only simply <laughs> connected the two rooms to create a bigger space of awareness in this. So, so I mean, children are really creative in trying to, to oh, sort so of yeah. develop these things. My son came to me and said, said Daddy, why do, we, why do they teach English in schools? There's nobody that needs any English teaching <laughs> yeah. these days yeah. because we all learn that yeah. through all of the games and... and, and uh, My sons are the same. <laughs> exactly. So, so there's, uh, the, the teaching is yeah. changing so much. And I get, what I really worries me is, is that, that when my son comes home from school a few years ago then, but, but still, when he comes home from the school and I ask him, uh, do you use your mobile phone in the school? No, he said, we, we ha have to hand them in because uh, the teacher says that this is a discipline problem. And I say, okay, so what have you been studying today? I've been studying social science today, okay. So what were you talking about? Well, we were talking about how Sweden is ruled. And, and, but I don't recognize the name of the prime minister in, in the book because it says that Göran Persson is Sweden's <laughs> prime minister. And I've <laughs> never heard that name before. That's what worries me yeah, much more. I get that. that. I get that. I have the word to Anders. Uh, I, I'm still a bit concerned about that we are discussing how toddlers and, and young kids should be allowed to use the tools. Uh, this spring there were uh, research published by a group of American researchers that uh, showed that you could, by analyzing images on Instagram, you could tell whether a person is depressed or not. Uh, people uh, uploading and using the, the filter Inkwell is more often depressed than those who are using other filters, for instance. And I think that uh, an, an understanding for that this data analysis is possible to do is important for all of us to have. Because the technology is here, and the question we have to discuss is how should it be allowed to be applied? Uh, should insurance companies be allowed to use that to, to decide how much I will pay for my, my insurance? Uh, or should healthcare services use that to screen the populations and earlier on detect who should uh, get help with their, uh, with their health? And, and uh, so, not so much focus just on, on, on the gadgets and the, and the physical tools, but about what's possible to do Can with code in, in general, I, I think. It's my phone <laughs> saying we only have four minutes left. <laughs> and um, why I'm all constantly walking towards my phone is because last week my, my middle son broke his ankle and we had an emergency question, so I'm really worried that some, and he's been back to school today, so I really want him, if he's phoning, I have to answer. We have talked about digital competence 
and the knowledge about digital tools. And we ended with an amazing panel. You made my day, all of you. It was so fun. I have never, ever <laughs> had such a good panel in front of me. Because you have different opinions and you actually stand, stood for something. And that was so fun. And all of you who came, thank you for this day. You have made it amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Christina has done a great job as well, right? Vi avslutar kvällen eller eftermiddagen med en keynote-talare nere i A1. Så att, ska man lyssna på honom så måste man röra på sig nu.